Back a couple months ago, I did an episode with Brandon Maddox, who is the founder and owner of Silencer Central. You should listen to that episode. It's episode 197. I love this company. I love this brand, and I love the American-made product that Silencer Central produces. I use the Banish 30 on my hunting rifle. And if you guys if you guys follow me on Instagram and you saw that video I put together, you'll see that it's not like what Hollywood portrays it as. It's not like it silences the rifle down into nothing. But it makes a huge difference. Like, my ears don't ring when I shoot. The animals don't know where the shot is coming from. It disorients the sound. And Silencer Central makes it super easy for you guys. Jump on to silencercentral.com and pick one out. They will. You could ship your rifle to them. They'll thread your barrel. They'll ship it back. This is like a 10-day process. And the ATF process is shortened significantly. It's like down to 48 hours or less. It's the best time ever to get a silencer on your weapon. And you should check it out because it's, it really is a game changer. SilencerCentral.com is where you could find them. Or you can call 866-891-4494. And they're happy to answer questions. It's crazy. They actually have people that answer their phone. Uh, again, guys, go to silencercentral.com. It's one of my favorite sponsors out there. These guys are just absolutely world class with these uh, world class products, and I can't recommend putting a silencer on your hunting rifle enough. Save your ears, disorient the sound in case you need another shot. I mean, it's just it's a game changer, folks. Uh, check it out. American-made products are the name of the game for me and the Western Huntsman. I really will go out of my way and spend more money to buy things that are American-made and keeps jobs and things like that right here in the United States of America. That brings us to Vantage Point Archery. If you haven't listened yet, wherever you listen to uh, your podcast as, go find episode 201, Vantage Point Archery with Ryan Corkwell and Jeff Stringer. Those are the founders of Vantage Point Archery, and these are great dudes. They'll give you a lot of the inside insight and information that you need on picking out your broadhead for this season. Don't wait any longer, guys, because season is going to be here before we know it. It's, it's almost here. I am going to be shooting the VPA Omega with bleeders for this elk season. They have the single bevels, two blade, three blades. These are great broadheads. They're American made. They're tried and true. They're tested. I've been shooting them all summer. i uh, really impressed with this company and I uh, couldn't be happier having them as a sponsor on this show. Happy to partner with them. Thanks, guys. There exists a threat, from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive, and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host. Coming at you from the Broken Town Studio right here in Northwest Montana, and I know it has been a while since I've sat behind this microphone. Uh, I've taken the last, uh, I don't know, three, four weeks off. Uh, it was a really busy sept- uh, school of September season and, and everything else that was going on, and so it is good to be back, and uh, it is really good to be back on one of my favorite past guests that we've had on a show uh, a guy we keep, we keep in touch and and uh, we we talk. He's had he had a really rough summer last summer. We might get into that. I don't know, but uh, either way, he's a world famous, world renowned guide out of uh, Wyoming, and uh, I'm proud to call him a friend, Fonzie Haskell. Thanks for joining me, brother. Thanks for having me, Jim. It's good to be back with you. And I don't I don't know about the world famous and world renowned stuff, but whatever. <laughs> well, I, I I I again I I told I tell this to everybody. I, I really try to pump you up so you feel like you have a lot to live up for <laughs> and when you're on the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I just leave everybody disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> no. You couldn't you couldn't disappoint anybody, man. Um it's sure fun. It's sure fun, man. Uh, following you like on Instagram and stuff, and seeing everything that you do through the year, and 
And uh, it's it's interesting. Like you know, a lot of people, man. Every time I'll put, especially if I have somebody from Wyoming on, you know them because you'll text me, "Hey, you too," and and uh, right. I I love that because it's 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 cool. You're one of those guys that just kind of builds a network, and you're friends with a lot of people, and that that just I don't know. I I like people like that. It's you're not boring. That's for sure. Well, that's well. I guess that's a good way to be. Keep keep it exciting, right? Exactly. So, how are things, man? We haven't we haven't actually talked in a long time. Yeah, it's it's been a while uh, since our last episode that we recorded together. Yeah, there's been a, a lot of exciting things happen, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty good for as old as I am, I guess you could say. And um, that, how are you recovering from that that four wheeler wreck last year? I'm I'm good. I'm uh, I have a new hundred percent, but I'm a hundred percent recovered. I've been uh, discharged from physical therapy, and um, as a result of physical therapy, I was able to avoid a shoulder surgery. So, uh, oh, good. yeah, everything. I can't I can't imagine it being any better. So, like any any new pains out there this hunting season, and and stuff from that, or is it, it you feel like you've just kind of moved past all that? Yeah, I'm by it. I don't have any. I don't have any lingering pains or anything. Occasionally, I'll get stiff. My back gets stiff, um, but it's nothing. A little stretching and uh, moving around doesn't alleviate. So, um, yeah, it's. I'm pretty. I'm. I'm extremely fortunate. Very, very blessed. The power of prayer is real. Oh man, I, I tell you what, brother. That's that's uh, that's the truest thing I've heard all day, all week. Heck. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, you know, just just in case anybody doesn't know who you are, give us give us a quick synopsis of what you do and where you live, and and uh, and we'll just kind of take it from there, brother. Okay, man. Yeah, I'm uh, like I said, I'm 48 years old. I've been in Wyoming my entire life. I was born and raised in Southwest Wyoming, in the thriving metropolis of Rock Springs, um, and you know, spent first 19 or so years of my life there, and then came to Northeast Wyoming. Um, and after making friends with some guys that I high school rodeoed with that have a ranch up here, uh, moved up to this part of the state and went to work for him. And I've worked for him for 26 years now on the ranch. And, uh, you know, there's kind of, anybody does their math, there's kind of a little bit of bouncing around in between there. I bounce around a few different places, living here and there with friends and rodeo and stuff. But essentially I, I, I called Rock Springs home and then uh, and then where I'm at now in Northeast Wyoming. So, yeah, I've been on this ranch for 26 years now. And as a result of it, uh, I got to guide hunters. And now I manage the outfitting business that not only operates on this ranch, but we lease a few other ranches as well for our outfitting. So, uh, yeah, it's Four Horse Outfitters is the name of the business. And primarily we... Uh, Mule deer and antelope hunting is kind of our bread and butter, but as uh, our elk numbers in, increased, we were taking few or a few more elk hunters every single year and killing some great bulls and you know killing cows to kind of keep numbers in check. But we've got a good whitetail population here as well, and some spring turkey, and then hunt coyotes in the winter time. So uh, I I'm living my childhood dream to be outside every day working on a ranch and and hunting. There is something just super Western and super nostalgic about that whole lifestyle. And that, you know, the, there is something like just culturally about all the dudes that I talk to from Wyoming. That, that's kind of like a real similar trajectory that a lot of them have been on. You know, they through rodeo, maybe they rent, they met some rancher and, you know, kind of worked into working on that ranch and then into a guide and and now running a guide and service and an outfitter and uh, it's just kind of a cool story. I, I think I think like dudes like me get envious of that. You know, I've I've had. Uh, I mean, I I I'm like you. I'm blessed to be. You know, I'm outside all the time. Uh, but I'm a roofer, and so sometimes That's, it sucks. <laughs> oh sure. Anybody who's who's roofed in July, they know, they they know what I'm talking about. But oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, and and uh, but but there's something just I don't know working on a ranch and in being a guide, uh, and and the way that that you guys present yourself uh, and the guys over at Eastman's like Scott Reekers and all those guys they're always they're always like oh you know Wyoming's way better than Montana Jim you got to come down here you got to just move on down here and I'm like man I I just I I would love to every time I've looked into it though 
these uh, negative 20 degree winters, um, I, you can have it. I, you can have it, man. I, I just, right. I, I'm, uh, we have bad winters here, but they don't get that cold. You know, we, we right. had, right. We yeah. had like a week of negative temperatures last, last winter, but we get a lot of snow. So I don't know what's worse. Um, yeah, it's, it's a matter of, you know, priorities, what you like and, and trade off. Sometimes you run out of places to put snow, but, uh, you know, that cold, yeah, everybody's, a lot of people think that it's a glamorous life, but like you say, those negative temp days and you got to be out in it, uh, every day. Cause you've got livestock dependent on you. You need to feed them. You got to make sure they got water. You got stuff froze up water. You got to get it thawed out and flowing and moving. So, livestock can get a drink you got equipment you know tractors pickups things like that that you need to use to get hay scattered and when it's cold that cold it things break uh it's it's hard and it's not glamorous and then this summer i don't know if we've set records but it seems like this has been the hottest summer that i remember in a long long time we've just had a lot of days that have been triple digits and dry and i mean that's that's no fun you still got to be out in it Mm -hmm. uh so you just try to stay hydrated and shade up as much as possible and just kind of kind of pace yourself so you don't overdo it yeah i kind of wanted to ask you about that and how that relates to how your september's been because like uh you know we it's not like it's been reverse we had we had a, a really hot start to the summer uh but but as we started creeping into august mid-august or whatever it kind of cooled down there for a while uh and, oh, and you know our summers here uh, because of how far north we are and everything, you know, you you really only consider July and August summer. You, you know, it's it's usually oh, yeah. you know we're we're not out there swimming in the lakes in uh, in June in most cases. Just it's just not warm enough yet, you know. And that, uh, I always consider summer when you could swim in the lakes. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah. And by Labor Day right. weekend, it's it's done. But it's weird. Once we got into September, though, that kind of shifted and summer like came back. And so it's been. Uh-huh. It's been really hot here. The bulls have been really quiet. Um, I, I have, uh, again, I, I was telling you before we, we hit record here, I've only spent maybe 10 days out chasing elk this September because because I've been so busy with, with my day job, um, and, and I cover a large area, so it's not like, you know, I can go to work and then be home in the early afternoon and head up the mountain or something. It's it's just not like that for me. I'm driving three hours to Missoula or two hours to Coeur d'Alene or you know whatever. And so, I I had I had one good day that was a bugle fest, and I think I posted uh, the the arrow that stuck in the deadfall uh, at the at the one bull I had a shot on so far. Um, he was <laughs> and he just he was so quiet, man. I bugled from up above him. And he's giving me these little monkey chuckles, you know, just just super quiet. So I actually thought he was further away. But when I dropped down to go after him, it was in some really dark timber. And so he was just standing there. And and I, I caught him out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> it was really funny. I'm like, oh, well, there's a bull standing there. And so I, I kind of slipped behind a tree. And he, he knew where I was, but he didn't know what I was, you know. And finally, yeah. he, he just got nervous enough, and he's sitting there chuckling. He's like 28, 29 yards from me at this point, but I couldn't get a I couldn't get an arrow through the brush. So he, he wanders off, man. And if if you listen to the school of September, my buddy Dirk, he he was yeah. talking about that thing he calls the wee ipe whiz bang, and it's it's where you blow, you you hit the bugle real hard, and then you run forward like forty yards and stop. And so I did that, and and no kidding, man. This bull turned around and gave me a shot, and uh, because it was so chaotic, I, I gauged him at like 40 yards in my mind. Turns out he was like 55, but I sent that arrow, and it was straight as you could be. I was so excited. I, You know, that slow motion time when that arrow's launching, and it's like, man, it's going to kill this bull, and then it drops right before him and hits the log in front of the bull. The bull buggers off, and it really hurt my feelings, man. He was a good bull. Yeah. <laughs> Especially to get it to all come together where he gave you that chance. Oh, man. Oh. It was so fun. It was so much fun. And, you know, I, I, I joke about how it hurt my feelings. I actually, it was one of the most fun nights I've had uh, up up in this particular area. Anytime, bulls were just bugling everywhere. It, it was perfect temperatures. The wind was right. Elk were screaming. And I, I just, man, it was such a... It, you know, I I feel bad for somebody that has never experienced something like that. People that don't hunt, 
and and right. the the magic of that whole day. And I I wasn't bummed when I got back to the truck. I mean, I, I literally it was it was even though I I missed that bowl, uh, you know, I was I was grateful that it was a clean miss. And um, but anyway, that that was a long way to tell you. Most of the months been it's been super hot and super windy, which has made the hunting a little difficult. And so I was curious how it's been for you guys. I know you've been doing some antelope hunts and and a bunch of elk hunting and so uh give us kind of your synopsis of how september's been and then we'll roll into october elk hunting yeah well it's it's kind of it's been the same here for us we've had you know a lot of days in the 90s mid to upper 90s in september today it's even 96 you know today's what sunday the 29th of september it's even 96 degrees here Fortunately, we're supposed to get a bit of a cool off here this next week, which should help. But yeah, it's it's made hunting tough. But our our antelope, our archery antelope hunts, we do those out of pop up blinds on water, uh, and a lot of because it's been so dry and hot, a lot of you know reservoirs and creeks and things like that have kind of dried up. Mm-hmm. So our reliable water sources that are man made, whether they be windmills, electric wells, solar wells, um, they're they're still flowing, and uh, in fact. On the ranch, we even go out of our way to make sure that they do work because the other natural water sources are dried up. And we want to keep the wildlife kind of spread out so they don't concentrate, um, you know, to prevent disease as much as we can, to prevent overpredation, things like that. We, yeah. we, you know, try to be stewards of them as well as the livestock that we take care of. So those utilizing those reliable water sources uh, is helped. Um, our hunting it's it, we had five uh, archery antelope hunters this year um typically we'll take more but i i booked a little less this year um and they were all successful um only we those are three day hunts and only one guy uh had to go to the third day um and he ended up killing one of the better bucks uh this year so that was that was a lot of fun but uh you know it, it was good and then we did have some September elk hunts. Unfortunately for us, the areas that we hunt, we get to hunt them with rifles in September. Oh um, man, that would be fun, actually. I mean, it, I love bow hunting. It is but come on. right, and you know, it's oh yeah, I, and so because we're hunting majority um, private land, these elk are under pressured, um, not call shy. So once they kind of get to where they're talking it's easy to call them in and hunt them and it's a lot of fun, but uh, yeah, same deal. It's been hot. It, the elk, it's been a first light, last light deal. And first light, when we get out first thing in the morning, we're just kind of getting an idea of where specific bulls are and watch where they kind of go to bed. And then we know where to be back for, you know, afternoon, evening hunt because it's just so hot and they're, they're headed to the timber early just to, yeah. to get shade and get out of the sun. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been good. We've had good success. We had uh, seven elk hunters over the course of the month of September. Six of the seven went home tagged out. Um, uh, I think that, the, the biggest bull we killed stats. was. Oh, absolutely. And, and the one guy that didn't tag, he, he shot a bull, wounded him. We just weren't able to recover him. Um, but, uh, yeah, the yeah. biggest bull we killed was a 365. Um, six by six uh killed a couple that are in the 340 range uh some others in the 330 range yeah good good bulls uh okay i i know he's uh he's posted it on instagram so i can say it but ike eastman came and hunted with us and killed a great old bull yeah Uh, i saw that yeah 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 i don't know why i don't know why you would ever let ike come over there without calling me and like (laughs) that's that's half criminal fonzie i just uh i know i'm sorry no uh in all seriousness is is to hunt to hunt with you fonzie is there like uh, a certain amount of points a guy has to have uh to to draw that specific tag or, or tell me how that works yeah, so we kind of got a new system for our non-resident elk this year. In the past, it's been uh, for a non-resident, you get a general license, a general elk license, and essentially that was good for all general areas in the state. This year, the Game and Fish Commission implemented the new system to where they sort of regionalized the non-resident uh, elk hunt areas. And so we have a western region, a southern region, and an eastern region. And so 
putting doing the license application i know talking to scott reekers he he kind of man's the tag hub deal there in Eastman's and yeah. talking to some other friends that are in the industry that do some consulting and booking and kind of number crunching. It was just a crap shoot on what it was going to be like for points to draw um, elk licenses in Wyoming this year. So we're in the Northeast part. So we fall in the Eastern region of, uh, of that with the, with our general areas. So this year, I believe it took five preference points to draw a non-resident East region um, uh, elk license. And I think that was five points was with the, what they call a full price license. Wyoming, like every state is, you know, kind of uh, screwed up and confusing on, on their terminology and licenses and tags and all of that. But Wyoming has two separate licenses. They have a, a full price license which I believe for a non-resident is uh, seven or eight hundred dollars, yeah. maybe a little more. I, I know they change it. It's less than a thousand. That's all I know. Right, and then they they changed the price of the special license. It used to be twelve hundred ish, and this year they changed it to two thousand um, dollars, thinking that there would be less applicants in that pool, so that would increase drawing odds. And you know, it's just all speculation. But anyways. So that's that's what it was. Uh, five points for the full price to draw uh, an East Region General license, and then I think it was four points uh, on the special on the special draw. Okay. So okay, uh, that's that's what it takes. And then we also have one other hunt area that is what's considered a limited quota area, where they issue only a certain amount of licenses for that specific hunt area. Um, and that one, it kind of varies. Uh, and, and, and again, it's not open every year. It's a, it's only open every three years that it's, um, mostly private land within that area. So the game and fish, you know, kind of consults with the landowners and see what they want to do, what they want their hunting seasons to look like and stuff. So enough, enough of a majority of the landowners think that hunting it every three years is ideal for, um, you know, getting elk to their trophy potential and stuff. I don't necessarily agree with their stance, but Hey, they can do whatever they want on their place. But yeah. Uh, so with that, that one, it takes a few more points. Um, I'm only, I'm only the 12, I think. Wow. Okay. I, I'm yeah. just, I'm asking just simply. So I'll, I'll have, I'll have four points at the end of this year for Wyoming. Okay. And and so my thought, Fonzie, was, you know, I just thought, okay, I'm going to I'm going to find a decent unit in that four to six point range or whatever for Wyoming and go down there and kind of DIY it or whatever. But I'm the more I think about it, it, it's like, you know, it takes years to get these points. And I've been buying points in Wyoming, you know, and I buy one point a year. So I'm at four, four points now. Um, and, And I I thought, you know, like, I feel like I'm a decent okay-ish average maybe slightly above average elk collar and locator and elk hunter in general whatever i'm i'm not like your normal you know dudes that do podcasts like aaron snyder and and cam haynes these guys are just absolute killers right I, i'm not on that yeah. level at all i brian barney you know I, i'm not on that level at all and so my my thought was i i would really like to find somebody like you uh to and and you know, burn my points hunting with somebody like like you guys to to really learn things and and expand my knowledge base of elk hunting through a guide. I've never been on a guided hunt. I, I I've yep. never no, that's not true. I hunted a wild boar on the Virgin River outside of Mesquite, Nevada, with a guide when I was eighteen. Right before I went to boot camp for the Marines, it was like my graduation oh, yeah. from high school present. And uh, okay, anyway, that was a one day little hunt. Yeah, um, so. Other than that, I've never actually been on a guided hunt. Uh, I have a lot of friends that are guides. I, I have an outfitting company right here in in, in uh, my neck of the woods that wants me to guide for them. And I had to tell them I'm not good enough for that. But um, I I just I, I've never done it. And so my my thought was okay. I've I'm getting older. I, you know, financially I can I can afford this kind of stuff now. Uh, maybe maybe I, I would like to expand and learn from somebody like Fonzie. Uh, and so I, I just, I, I might have to pick your brain when we're not recording, I, I suppose. So I don't drag this out on, uh, you know, talking about me coming to Wyoming and hunting, but I would love to do something like that. The only thing I would ask of sure. you 
is um, once you have Ike's bowl scored, I, I need you to find me a bowl. I don't care if it's one point, but it's got to be more than Ike's bowl. <laughs> And and I'll be okay. cool. With it. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. Was he wearing his famous cowboy hat when he shot that bad boy? No, he was wearing his uh, orange Eastman's hunt, oh, uh, okay. hunting hat. Okay, uh, yeah, yep. that makes sense. I guess it was rifle hunting, right? Um, yeah. So okay, cool. Well, uh, just so the audience knows, what what my thought was, we have spent a lot of time on this show talking about September archery hunting and calling in elk and locating elk and and all the things that we go through in in September hunting these bulls during the rut. And um, I wanted to kind of give my rifle hunters some love, and and that was. Uh, because uh, obviously by the time this is released, it's going to be October. It's, it's currently the 29th of September. I have one more day archery season in Idaho because I have an Idaho and a Montana tag this year. So I'm going to go give it hell tomorrow oh. in, in Idaho. Um, and then I'll switch. Archery stays open in my area in Montana till the 20th of October. So I've got plenty of time uh, for to chase elk over here. So I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about... Uh, they kind of do a school of October for our rifle hunters. And the, the, the reason is, is because if, if you listen to this show a lot, especially the school of September's or the episodes, you know, you're going to learn a lot about elk behavior, what they're doing during the rut, like the active September rut. What a lot of people don't understand is they're still rutting in October and oh, absolutely. things kind of change and there's a lot of ebbs and flows with what they do behaviorally and maybe towards the end of the month the bulls are starting to break off and kind of you know move back and lick their wounds from the rut and all this kind of stuff but i wanted to get a professional's take somebody that does this every year multiple times with clients uh guides have a lot of really good perspective and guides come at this from you know I, there's something different when you are doing something in return for in exchange for money, right? You, you, it becomes this business mindset where results actually really matter. And so I feel like you guys learn a lot by doing it that way. Um, and, and so that's why I, I really thought it was, it would be helpful for a lot of listeners that are about to go out for their October rifle hunts to kind of hear some perspective. And let me ask you some questions about how you go about hunting elk and locating bulls and all that kind of stuff in October. Sound good? Sure. Absolutely. So I, first, first and foremost, what, what do you think really changes? Uh, what is like the biggest, uh, difference from hunting September during like the peak rut times and all that, that we consider, uh, versus hunting like mid October going, going into October, kind of walk us through what you think bulls are doing from actually not mid October, walk us through what you think the elk are doing from like the beginning to the end of the month and how things differ from September. Hopefully that made sense. That was quite the question. Yep. No, yeah, sure did. You know, and um, uh, last year when I was laying around recovering from my wreck, uh, Scott sent me a bunch of videos of, you know, just some stuff, a little care package from Eastman's. And one of them was uh, uh, Guy Eastman's, um, I think, five or five or six different phases of the rut. And I watched that and I thought, yeah, that's kind of interesting. I've never thought of it that way, but that's that's right. So when we leave September – when they kind of just are starting to rut, you know, it's, there's usually a, a moon phase, a full moon in there somewhere that's going to interrupt things and mess with that. And, and that's something we had this year. We just got over, a, uh, or we had um, a full moon, moon yeah. right at right at the beginning of the scheduled rut. Yep. And coupled that with heat, I mean, they just were not talking. Uh, they just were not out during the day. You didn't see them. So when we get into October – Typically, it's cooler. The temperature changes. So those bulls, they're not overheating. They're going to stay active, I think, more more hours during the day uh, rutting because it's not as hot. They can, uh, you know, stay cool. And sure, they're heating up, but, you know, it's 50, 60 degrees outside instead of you know, 70, 80. Yeah. That makes a difference. Big difference. So I think, uh, yeah, be, seeing them. Um, so you're not – I don't think you're going to have to focus on your – your north facing dark timber slopes as much um they'll still be there because it's just such a great hiding spot you know if they have if they've had any kind of pressure that's where they go uh but if they don't they might stay on those south facing slopes that 
you know, reveal a little more or show a little more sun and reveal themselves a little more. Um, so I think glassing comes into play a lot. You're going to be looking for numbers. Obviously, bulls are going to have big harems of cows and there's going to be satellite bulls circling, circling those uh, bunches. And so utilizing glass is going to help. Obviously, elk, they're big noisy buggers. They, mm-hmm. They're not discreet about anything. So having your ear to the wind and, and knowing, uh, what, knowing what to listen for, the different, different sounds that they make, the different bugles, um, you know, cows and calves being vocal with one another, uh, hearing that. So if you're moving from timber stand to timber stand, um, just being aware of that, listening for that kind of stuff. But I, I think um, beginning a rut to, to this time of the year, you're just going to be looking more for numbers. Um, and, you know, they're big and loud maybe not having to worry about as being as stealthy because maybe you're not hunting with a bow. Uh, Now you're hunting with a rifle in, in October uh, versus a bow in September. So you don't have to worry about getting as close to them and being as quiet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can still stumble into them and bump them, but uh, you know, I think you can cover a lot of country with your glass um, more in, in October than you can in, in September. So with with that being said, there's a couple things that you you threw out there I want to ask you about, uh, dig a little deeper. One thing that I've noticed, uh, again, this is a guy from Idaho, so my my archery season has, um, you know, historically ended on September 30th, and I'm kind of done, and then we we switched to deer hunting at that point, and then I, I had like a late rifle season. Uh, yep. like five days or whatever. I, I, I rarely even went out for that because I was usually chasing bears or, or big whitetail or mule deer or something. But anyway, um, when I, I, I notice when I'm out, it feels like in October, the, the cows talk a lot more than they do in September. They, they just seem I agree. to, and, and I just, that's, do you, do you, that, that's what, what I was going to ask. Is that something that you've noticed is, are they more talkative? Uh, not, not the bulls, the cows, and they just seem to chirp yes. all the time. Yep. I think they're, they're far more vocal. I'm, and I don't know why that is. I don't. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Cause they'll, they stay, they stay together all winter long. So it's not like a cow is trying to wean her calf and, you know, get rid of him. But I, I don't know why they're so much more vocal, uh, but it, it's interesting. And, you know, I've located elk because of cows and calves chirping. Uh, versus, you know, a bugle. Unless you were born yesterday, you're very well aware of the fact that a lot of companies spend a lot of money on marketing and advertising and just their overly proudness of, uh, <laughs> if that's a word, their name recognition. This is not the case with Hoffman Boots, guys. Don't don't go drop 500 bucks on, on a good pair of boots when you can go to hoffmanboots.com and check out the uh, Hoffman Explorers. They're, they start at 370 bucks. I could save you 10% off of that by using promo code HUNTSMAN10. Guys, I've been traipsing through the mountains of the western United States for almost a decade in these boots. They're totally waterproof. There's no breaking period. They're every bit as good as those high-dollar boots out there that you see for a lot less. So don't waste your money on the other stuff. These boots have everything you need for a lot less, and I wouldn't steer you in the wrong direction. I wouldn't recommend them if I don't use them myself and don't absolutely love them. Check it out at hoppinboots.com. Promo code is HUNTSMAN10. And I, I remember I took my uh, I took my daughter out for a, a deer hunt, and we we're we're kind of sitting on this little drainage on the top of this. Uh, I don't know. It, it was it was like this uh, little ravine, and it had kind of a bare meadow down below, and so bucks would you know cruise through there all the time. So we're sitting up up above, probably a hundred yards, but for for thirty minutes, you can hear these distant mews going on, and this is like probably October tenth or eleventh. All these yeah. distant mews going on, and and they kept getting closer and closer and closer, and finally, they they kind of break into that that meadow. Um, elk season is not o- open at this point for us because we we're archery hunters, and um, all these cows come just casually walking through this meadow. I don't know, nine a.m. ish, and they're as they're walking, it's like they had no reason to be mewing at each other, but they all just kind of kept mewing the whole time, and and they're just like I don't know. There was twelve, thirteen of them, and then there was a uh, I don't know, a little satellite bull with him at the at the very end, but he just stayed quiet. And so I just, I've never seen that in September. 
it's almost like the cows stay quieter for the sake of not attracting other cows if they've got some bull they're, uh, they're pretty proud of or something, you know? I I don't know. Well, I always try to relate it in, like, human nature so when I can, and, and, and I don't know if that's a thing or not. But um, the other thing you mentioned is you don't have to be as stealthy, um, you know, and, and as quiet or, or, or whatnot. But what about... For so obviously the range is going to change dramatically with a rifle, right? Wh- at what point do you feel like wind becomes an issue? Is it five hundred yards? Is it seven hundred yards? Or, or is there is there like this rule of thumb you have about when the the wind starts making you nervous when you've got when you've got a rifle and you can really reach out there and touch them? Yeah, th- that and that's absolutely a thing, especially um, I'm in Wyoming. The wind the Wyoming starts with a W because of the wind. We have <laughs> wind all of the time. And so that's always a factor. And I always take that into consideration, the wind direction as to how I'm going to approach something. So, and it doesn't matter uh, if it's miles or hun- a few hundred yards or whatever. I try to keep it um, always going away from the elk. Uh, I, they have such a keen sense of smell. And it swirls so quick and easy, just like just like archery hunting. You know, when you're going in on a stock, you're constantly checking the wind because Mm -hmm. it swirls. And and even if you're, you know, 60, 80 yards away on a stock and it's a light, light breeze, but just that little bit of swirl and they bust you. That's how sensitive they are. So I always try to keep the wind. um, I always try to be downwind of them or crosswind. You know, it's not always ideal, but I don't ever want the elk uh, downwind from me. So if they're if they're seven hundred yards across a drainage at your same elevation, are you worried about wind at that point? Um, yeah, I think they can figure it out. I yeah. think they can they can smell you. They can pick it up. Uh, I don't know if it's a lot. I I think it's a. I don't know if it's enough that they can say, "Yo, that's a human." Or if they just get enough to say, yeah, no thanks. That's something that we're not familiar with, and I'm, I, I don't want any part of it. And then they just kind of disappear into the timber. With all these clients that you've taken out in October for a rifle hunt, what what do you think like the number one mistake that has cost them a notch tag has been over the years? Um. That's a good question. I haven't taken many elk hunters in October. The majority of them have been mule deer and antelope. Uh, I would say ego, not listening, not listening, whether, you know, I've been guiding for 26 years. I'm 48. So I've been guiding since I was 22. In the first few years, you know, I've got guys that are, that were, you know, the age that I am now coming and like, why am I going to listen to this punk kid? Well, mm-hmm. you're from you're from down south. I'm from here. Do I know everything? No, but I I know enough. You know, uh, at least listen to me and, and take it into consideration. Don't just let your ego get in the way and you know rush a shot. Whether it be you know rush a shot, not listen to me on a wind hold. Uh, if if we're you know at, at an extended range where you've got to compensate for bullet drop and wind deflection, you know, not take my advice on that or uh, rushing into a situation. Yeah. I think ego has been, been the biggest, uh, big, biggest thing. So it's, it, I mean, that's the same with, I mean, you look at anything hunting wise, I, I think that ego ruins more hunts than anything does. And, and not, Absolutely. not just in the field. You know, you, you come back, you remember, you, you know, I always, uh, when I when I was working for these other companies down in town and whatnot, I used to call them the coffee cup gang. You know, everybody yeah. would get around and waste their boss's first hour of pay drinking coffee and telling stories and whatever. You know, I always like to use times like that um, to learn from people. But I, I started finding and this is probably true in your world too, but I started finding like I was, I was trying to learn things and cause I, I've never really had, I've never been a super confident hunter over the years. I, I've just never had like this big ego about my ability to hunt. I've in fa- it's been like the opposite. I've been not very confident and wanting to soak up as much as I can from other people, even though I've hunted all my life and I, I've killed a lot of animals. 
And, and, sure. you know, so it's, I, I was, I was figuring out that, man, I am taking some of the information that these people are saying, and I'm learning that that is just based in their own ego and, and their own legends in their own mind, if that makes sense, you know, and, and like, they're kind of right. leading me astray. And with the exception of some, you know, folks that I, you, you know, you, you always meet people that you could just tell they don't really have any ego with what they're talking about. It's just really um, a lot of humble gratitude and, and experience behind what they're talking about. One of the guys that uh, guides at this outfitter up the road, he, he's like this. He's just, you know, one of the most humble, nicest guys you'll ever meet in your life. Uh, you'd never know that the, you could cash a check. Uh, by making bets that he's going to kill something or, or one of his clients is going to kill something, but you'd never know it. Sure. You know, and, and, and it's those kind of people that I like to learn from. And so ego, I think it's, it's such a, it's such a hunt killer for so many, especially dudes. Cause dudes are just, you know, we're, we're, we're all full of ego at some point, you know? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and so there's just kind of no, it's how God made us, I guess, you know, there's just no way around yeah. it. And so, um, and so it's just interesting to hear you say that. Um, I want to. Oh, I, th- here's another one. I, I had I had a few questions written down here. I, I know it sounds kind of like I, we're doing like some uh, Q Q and A thing here, but I I think people get a lot out of it. Uh, calling. Talk to me about calling in October. What What do you use? Do you is there like I've had a lot of guys tell me that hey, you know, up until the 10th of October, you just call like it's September. And then after that, maybe switch to cow calls or what or whatever. Everybody's kind of got a little different take. What's your take on calling in in October? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think you still bugle, but I think you incorporate a lot more cow calls into it. Um, and obviously, the later you get into the month, um, maybe even a little more so with the cow calls. But for example, uh, it's been oh two or three seasons ago. I had a, a few hunters that were mule deer and antelope hunters and they were tagged out. And there were some other guys that were in their party that were still hunting and they still had a few days left on their hunt. And I said, well, there's not any sense in uh, sitting around at the lodge here. I said, let's go be useful. We'll be an extra set of eyes in the field for these guys and see if we can help them locate, you know, mule deer and antelope. Uh, so we were out just out in the field, looking around, seeing some country and looking at wildlife. And we happened to get up, uh, pretty close to our um core elk country and uh we got out we're just glassing and could hear kind of a faint bugle in the distance and these guys were from down south and had never heard that they said what was that i said that was an elk bugle like really you have elk ears like yeah quite a few of them actually and uh so i got back in the pickup and digging around in there and i didn't have my any of my elk calls with me man you know because i wasn't hunting elk so i didn't have with me uh, so I got to digging around and I found in my backpack, I actually had, um, uh, an open read call that I used for calling coyotes, howling coyotes and making prey distress. And I thought I could, I know I can cow call with this. I've, I've, I've done it. Heck so yeah. I just got out and, and I just started cow calling. And then all of a sudden this bugle starts getting louder and closer. It's like, Whoa. And these guys are getting pretty big eyed, like. Um, you know, what's going on here? What do we do? And, you know, they were about half nervous. Like, are we about to get ran over and charged or, you know, <laughs> what's going on? So I just kept cow calling and this bull kept bugling more and more and getting closer and all of a sudden came in sight and he, he was a young raghorn. Yeah. Uh, but we called him in then, and then with all of his carrying on, he was, he was kind of to the East of us to the West of us. I mean, the, the bugle and really started lighting up. I was like, Either we got uh, somebody else over here with some bugle tubes and they're calling back to us or we're kind of right in the middle of the elk. And sure enough, the elk just started materializing out of the timber. Um, And there was three different uh, bulls with harems of cows. And we were right in the middle of them. And all I did was cow call. And these bulls being vocal just kind of got everybody else going. And the cows were talking and carrying on. And it was, that went on for, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes. And we were standing in the wide open out in the middle wow. of this big stage flat, right on the edge of the timber. Uh-huh. Those bulls could see us. The the one that we first called, he was circling down windows, just trying to make us out what we were and see what else was going on. And he knew he didn't want any part of them other bulls that had come out of the timber with, uh, with their cows. But, you know, he was just trying to see, you know, I heard cow calls come right here. 
here's something here, but I don't know what it is. And so anyways, they just eventually curiosity was satisfied. They went back to the trees. Gosh, <laughs> that's crazy. Funny. What what time of the what time of the month did you say that was? It was early October, like October seventh or eighth. Oh, okay. Uh, okay so, yeah. Yeah, er, early October. And the one guy, he looked at me and he just had this amazed look on his face. He said, uh, he said, you just gave me my first hit of cocaine and I'm hooked. <laughs> when can I come back? That's no joke, so, man. Yeah, that, I, but that's all it was. So I think cow calling is very, uh, very important just because the cows are naturally vocal and then throw in, throw in some bugles. I don't know if you necessarily need to challenge because by then they're far enough into the road. I think those bulls have been, uh, been established, but I think mm -hmm. you're going to get something to show themselves. If you do some cow calls and just kind of maybe some locator, um, bugles that I think you'll get stuff to materialize. Gosh, man. I, I love taking people that like don't live in elk country and, and have never actually heard a bugle. And, and I just yeah. love seeing that look on their face when it, when all of a sudden, this 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 bull starts just bugling his head off, and and it's just oh, yeah. out of this world for for guys that have never heard it. You know, it's just it's it something is. else. I I love it. Even even uh, taking my daughters out, who I mean, we have bugles right here, uh, right off our back deck all all freaking September and October. You know, and uh, I I just I still love seeing their face light up when we're actually hunting and one chimes out because both of them are actually uh, both of my girls are hunting uh, this year for the first time in archery season, and so That'll they're fun. Yeah, they're carrying their own bow bows. My uh, my older daughter almost nailed a cow the other day. We needed like I don't know ten fifteen more yards, and you know we were talking about wind earlier, and and I knew I knew at some point she was going to catch that thermal. But it was just light enough. She got within about forty five yards and my, my daughter's not comfortable past thirty, you know. And uh sure. it was a big old cow too. I was super excited. But I, I knew those thermals were coming down. You couldn't really feel it, but man, her nose went straight up in the air and she turned around and left our lives forever. But uh <laughs> Yeah, they're so smart. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they really are. I mean and, and I don't know, man. That's that's what makes it so much fun though. I just I, I love it. So um getting back to okay so i i want to ask you like for you personally you you've been you've been doing this a long time like you said guiding for 26 years hunting you know you lived in wyoming your whole life um talk uh, can you explain kind of picking out the country and what you're looking for when you're trying to because a lot of people are i like to put it in this kind of context a lot of people are going out this season and it's probably not their first season, but maybe for some folks, it's going to be their first October rifle hunt for elk. And the, you know, that old saying, you can't kill elk until you find elk, right? You're, right. you're in an area, you're in a new area, maybe, you know, that this probably doesn't happen to you anymore where the, all the areas you hunt. But let's say you're in a brand new area. What are you looking for? What, what key characteristics in a landscape are you kind of trying to identify as where your gut is going to tell you there's going to be elk in there uh, in, in October. I, I know we talked about North Face, South Face, all, all that kind of stuff that doesn't really apply in October. But what what really are you looking for where you just have this gut instinct, you know there's going to be elk in there, and and it's it's because of something with the terrain or the landscape. Does, do, is this making any sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, and I think that I think this is applicable to all wildlife or animals or whatever. It's just cover food uh and water you know that's the things that they need to survive elk aren't as affected by weather like other animals are so they can take a lot of cold um they can take some snow so if there's snow in the high country doesn't necessarily mean there's not going to be elk there they might you know that snow might drive bighorn sheep and mountain goats and um and deer out of that higher country where the elk might stay because they've got everything they need and are under pressured. So a, a reliable water source, you get into October, you're getting into colder temps, uh, you know, ponds, uh, things like that might be starting to freeze and it's a little harder for them to get a drink. Whereas a small creek might still be running the river, uh, things like that. They can, they can get a, a drink. And, and like, and like you said, um, about elk you know you can't kill elk until you get to where the elk are 
And just because they're not there where you're at today doesn't mean they won't be tomorrow because elk are fickle. They just go on a, they're like gypsies. They just wander about for no reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, or see, it seems that way. I know they have a reason that they do it. So, um, yeah, I think being in country where all of those things exist, um, it's tough with public land to get away from pressure, but sometimes they, they figure out how to live in between the pressure. Um, so there's going to be, you know, guys using ATVs and side by sides and whatever traveling, traveling roads and just going by stuff. And there might be a small pocket of quaking aspens or timber or whatever that's easy to overlook because you'll overlook it and say, ah, oh, there's not any elk there. But if you get far enough away, the wind's right, you sit in glass and start picking apart. You're like, oh, there's a there's an elk. Oh, there's an elk. There's an elk. Or or they yeah, just kind of yeah. get up and start to materialize and coming out of there. So I think slowing down is is a a big key slow down and just don't get in a hurry. Uh, they're not in a hurry, right? Mm -hmm. As humans, we're on, we're on a schedule. We got, we got a watch. We got a, we got alarms. We got reminders. Animals don't. Their, their, their watch is the sun coming up, the sun going down. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I, I'm assuming again, a lot of these questions just come from my own curiosity, man, because I, I don't normally sure. hunt uh elk in october i just i just don't really do that uh so um i'm gonna this year though uh yeah generally speaking in september you know the elk are herded up there's usually a herd bull there's some satellite bulls and a bunch of cows and you know some maybe maybe a few calves running around you know here and there um, it, it, at nighttime, they're down low in the meadows, they're feeding, uh, where they feel safe. And then, you know, as soon as that, uh, we start getting hints of morning, they start making their way up to, uh, you know, higher country where they've got some upward thermals to sit around all day and, and meander. Uh, and then as we start getting closer to sundown, they start making their way back down into those meadows for the evening. Is that, is that kind of the same basic foundational process of what, what elk, elk behavior you, you see in October? Yes, I think so. I think they're, they're a little more patternable in that sense, uh, as far as, you know, their feeding and bedding habits and behavior. Um, it might not be exact that, you know, they're on a, on a trail because a whitetail, um, I know you hunt whitetail there and we have some here, they'll they'll stay on a route and they don't deviate unless something changes that yeah. uh, for them you know they'll they'll utilize the same feeding bedding area and the same trail going between uh whereas uh, an elk won't they'll typically kind of stay close ish as long as there's not something to pressure them but they don't they don't necessarily always follow the same trail but yeah if if, if they've had good feed in a, in a meadow or something like that the night before um there's nothing to change that and then make them not come back. They just might approach it from a, a different avenue. Okay. Th this next question comes from a listener. Um, he says, I, uh, I, I have a wallow that I like to sit on. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for uh, let me break from the question. For, for me, I, I think wallow, I think September and rut and all that kind of stuff. The the rut is still going on technically in October, so this does make yeah. sense to me. So I just want to, I just kind of want to get your take on it. Okay, back to the his question is, I have a wallow that I I like to sit on, and I was wondering if um if I'm up above the wallow, and uh if it would work if I used cow calls just r r variously or randomly through the day to see if if there's a bull nearby the wallow is this, is that's essentially what he's asking. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I I've never, I've never done that. I, I don't have the patience to sit on a wall or for more than, you know, five, 10 minutes. <laughs> if there's not a bull bugling, I just move on, you know? So, right. uh, what, what, what do you think of that? That question? No, I, I, no, I think that's good just because of what the cows and calves are naturally doing anyways, that time of the year, because they're vocal and communicating. Um, I, I, I don't think it can hurt. You know, maybe you're not 100% stealthy and quiet coming in there and you made some noise mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, elk are noisy, but sound like an elk and, and, you know, you're tr going in there trying to be quiet and you snap a twig or whatever. Right. And they, yeah. uh, they're like, what was that? Well, if, if there's a cow call to come and kind of, uh, 
you know, settle their nerves or whatever, then I, I think that's beneficial. Uh, if, if there's a possibility of getting a, elk will still wallow, those bulls will still wallow in early to mid October, I think. Uh, just they do it to cool off. I, there's a variety of reasons that they do it. I don't know all of them, but I think to cool off, but also if you ever been around a wallow, you smell it. Like, oh crap, man, that thing stinks, but Stinky. they mark their territory. Yep. Oh, they stink bad, but they, you know, mark in their territory. It, it all stinks to me, but it, it has different stinks to them. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, get, get around it without contaminating it, but kind of look around and see if you see some fresh sign of, of a bull being there recently, you know, maybe the tracks, uh, don't look like they're dried out or anything, but they're fresh and, uh, you know, maybe some wet, uh, ground around there to where he was in there wallowing and, and got out and was dripping. Um, you know, stuff like that. If, you know, so look for a variety of signs to see that that wall is fresh and that there's a bull laying on it because he'll, I think he'll lay around it and protect it because it's his, he doesn't want other bulls coming in there. Mm -hmm. Um, he's likely going to have some cows around there too, uh, that he's got laying around there. So he doesn't want another bull coming in, taking his wallow or his cows. So I think cow Collins, uh, He's going to say, hey, my girls were just here. I just checked on them. What's this new one? Yeah. Uh, come watering in. So, yeah, I, I I don't think it can hurt. Okay. That's good to know. I, I, I might try that. I might try that. I, I, I have a couple wallows yeah. here I've, I've found in Montana that <laughs> I might I might go sit on and just throw out some cow calls or whatever. I should go put cameras on them, actually. Um, right. Okay. So, essentially, in October... A lot of what I, you know, I've I've gotten from you and and other folks in the past is is you you're getting into areas where you have a lot of uh, area to glass. What about like a uh, kind of a, you know, still hunting thing where you just slowly moving through the woods? Do you ever do something like that for for elk, or is that more of like a mule deer thing? No, you can do that for elk as well, especially if you have snow on the ground. And, uh, you know, you're still hunting through there. That kind of helps you to be even a little more quiet, Mm -hmm. that cushion of snow to walk on. So, um, yeah, look for fresh sign, fresh tracks. And then you've got the contrast between the color of the elk, snow on the ground. uh, They'll stick out a little easier, whereas, you know, you're looking for a brown tan animal against a brown background. It's Boy, they really blend in. You can stumble in. They'll see you long before you see them. So, yeah, in October, likelihood of snow on the ground is greater. Um, so still hunting, being quiet and still hunting, I think is is good. The later you get into October, I think you're going to find elk uh, bunching up more. If you're in places that uh, elk migrate between a summer and a winter range, you get into the mid-October, depending on what the snow is like, you know, above 10,000 feet uh, or around that elevation, you know, it's going to start driving them down from 10,000 feet to 8,000 feet. If you're hunting in that, you know, seven to 8,000 foot window, mm-hmm. you're probably going to see more elk in that, uh, at that elevation than you would in say September. So, um, I think you can be looking for more elk instead of just little pockets of, you know, a bull and a handful of, uh, a harem of cows versus you're going to have, you know, they're going to be the tail end of the rut. You're going to have bulls still rutting and chasing, but the cows, or starting to congregate a little more. So when they're bedded in the middle of the day, yeah, still hunting in a stand of timber, um, I, I think is very beneficial. What's the best time to catch the elk moving around, in your opinion? Is it first light or last light? Or, or is it the same? Um, I think I think the same. I think the same because, again, if you've got snow on the ground, they're, I think they're going to stay out later in the morning to uh, just get more uh, feed and – you know, a little slower to go back to bed, you know, the snow, it's going to, it's going to deter some people as well. So there's a likelihood they might have less pressure, pressure, um, from, from hunters. So, or there may be people that are just archers only or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think they do stay out later, come out earlier. I can't remember. And I need to find it. And when I do, I'll share it with you. There was a hunter I had a couple of years ago, uh, mule deer and antelope hunt. He was from the South, uh, Mississippi, maybe. And he was showing me an app on his phone that showed um, the hours and, and times of day that is best for fishing and for hunting because 
the fish are moving and more active and uh, wildlife are just t- tend to move. So the few days that we were hunting together, we kind of tracked that. And it seemed to be uh, really, really close. I wouldn't say that it was absolutely precise, but yeah. there it was, clo- it was close. And I don't know, I don't know if moon phase, I don't know if barometric pressure, I don't know what affected it or indicated that stuff, but there was something to that. So I'd say the world that we live in today and the technology that we have available to us, um, we can utilize that kind of stuff and see, you know, is it, uh, is it a barometer low? Is it a low pressure? Is there a storm coming? Um, the animals are going to be on their feet sooner feeding. If there's a storm coming, you know, overnight, um, they're going to want to pack on the nutrients and the, and the, uh, feed as much as possible to stay a little extra warm for this, you know, impending storm or, or whatever. Um, okay. so that kind of stuff, I think utilizing that can help too. I don't know if there's one, one thing that you can necessarily set your watch by, but I think there's enough, um, influencing things and indicators that together in conjunction can certainly increase your success. In the odds. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm always going for is getting everybody's perception as to what are, what are the things that are going to up your odds? Cause they're, you know, yeah. a lot of people we've talked about this on the show a million times. A lot of people are they're They're like in this um, endless search for a, an easy button, you know, a cheat code, mm-hmm. a, a, you know, some way. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, is these conversations, school of October, school of September, all, you know, how to, how to get a bear, whatever, all these conversations are, you know, kind of based in this unspoken vagueness that is is just rules of thumb. There's no one certain thing that is going to work every time. And it's all also delivered under the understanding that it, none of this information is going to make it easy. I mean, it's still elk hunting. It's going to be a bitch. I, I mean, there, there's no two ways about oh, it. It's still going to be a bitch. It's elk hunting. It's hard. You have to put in the work. You have to put in the miles. You have to put in the time. Uh, there, there's, uh, you know, you're not going to listen to a bunch of podcasts and have a have a have an elk down, you know, 300 yards from the truck w- within the first hour of sunlight on opening day. Uh, you know that that's not <laughs> what this is designed for. This is this is all just no. uh, for those out there that are willing to put in the work, time, and effort, and and blood, sweat, and tears, and practice, and you know, the, the purchasing the right gear and all, all this stuff that goes into successful hunting, you know, it, it, everybody that does that, here's the extra information that might even get you a little closer. And that, that's kind of what my goal is with all this kind of stuff. And just everybody has a little different take. And I love that. Sure. I, I, oh, I just, absolutely. You know, so. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Uh, great conversation. I, I just, I, I, I feel like we can keep this going for like another two hours. I, but, uh, I know we're both sure. on tight scale. You're about to head out tomorrow, huh? You got clients coming in. Yeah. Our first round of, uh, rifle antelope and mule deer hunters, uh, arrive tomorrow and we'll start hunting on uh, Tuesday the first. So yeah, I'm Good just deal. gathering up all, all my gear and getting my camper packed up and loaded up so I can take it down to our lodge. We call it a hunting camp, but it's, it's not a camp. It's a, it's a pretty nice lodge, 6,500 square foot and got nice. 12 bedrooms in it, five bathrooms. And it's, uh, the only thing that doesn't make it a five stars. We don't have a hot tub, but, uh, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say it's four and a half star, but anyways, yeah, getting ready to pack up and head that way. And that's where I'll be for the next 20 days is, uh, just filtering mule deer and antelope hunters through and so it'll so be you don't, it'll be fun. It's what we look forward to every year. You don't get a stay in the lodge. You have to take a trailer down there and stay in that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and it's all right. That way, I can when I need a little quiet time, a little peace and quiet, and just go read a book or whatever. Or yeah. Get on the phone and call home, call mom and the kids. I can I can do it in some peace and quiet. And if those guys want to stay up and carry on and play yeah. pool or tell stories, whatever they can do that. So I like to stay up, drink beer, tell loud, nasty jokes and lie to each other. That's, that's what they're doing when they, you know, what? They, <laughs> they need to be, they need to be rested up for the next day. No, I, I love I, right. what kind of trailer do you have me? And I'm, I'm, I'm like kind of on this kick where I'm, um, I, I'm ready to buy, you know, my wife and I and the girls, we, we lived in a fifth wheel for, for two years. So we, we have not had any inclination to go load up a camp, a trailer and go camping anymore. And that's a crying shame because that's what we used to love to do. 
as a as a family, you know. And now now that that you know we've we've been a year in a house now, a real house that doesn't shake when the wind blows, and um, <laughs> I'm ready to buy another one. And I've got my eyes on this per- particular brand, and I don't want to say it on here or anything just yet, but uh, I'm pretty excited because uh, anybody laughing and and think you're you're hardcore because you'll only stay in a tent. Let me tell you something, folks. I I lived in a pack for months at a time in war zones. I don't need, I don't need to prove my toughness. I like a freaking trailer. And so, um, right. The, uh, what, what kind do you have that? That's what I guess I see. I get side, man, I'm rusty at doing podcasts. This is what happens when I take this long of a break. What, what kind of, what kind of trailer are you going to be rolling in, man? It's uh it's, I think it's a 28 foot, uh, travel trailer, kind of a toy hauler. Uh, that's something that we like to do too. My wife and kids and I, we like to, load up ATVs and go to the mountains and just ride trails and see different country. But yeah, that's, it's a, it's a toy hauler. So I plug it into electricity and got my own shower and bathroom and my own bed. And, you know, we just kind of keep all my stuff in there. So it, it's nice. It's fun. I was looking at a toy hauler, man. And, uh, I was told, and maybe you could correct this. I, I was told when you put your AT, ATV in there, you start getting like this gas smell and it kind of takes over the whole trailer. Is that true? Or is that just kind of bogus? Cause I don't, spill I've heard gas. people say that, right. I've heard people say that too, but that's not been my experience because, uh, if you're, you know, motorcycle or four wheeler or whatever, if it doesn't leak gas or oil, how are you going to have that smell in there? So if it does put a piece of, of cardboard my... down, it'll absorb all that. Sure. Just take the cardboard right. outside. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. And then just leave the back door open and let it air out. Exactly. It's pretty easy. When you're camp. Yeah, yeah. So somebody told my wife that, that they smell like gas all the time, and now she won't even consider them. So um, no. smack that guy. <laughs> right. Well, Fonzie, best of luck to you this fall, man. Uh, again, I, I really appreciate you jumping on. Um, for those of you listening, I, I I reached out, what was it, yesterday or maybe Friday? I'm like, hey, you want to jump think, on yeah, and do a podcast? Friday. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is super last minute. It's Sunday today. And so yeah. super last minute. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, it's good to get the juices flowing and get behind the microphone again because, it, again, it's been a few weeks for me. But um, thanks a bunch for coming on. I think a lot of people are, are going to just get a lot out of that. And especially me, man, I, I normally, by, by September 30th, I, I have shut elk off for the year and I'm, I'm moving on to deer and bear and everything else, you know. And so... Uh, I, this is going to be like the most, most elk hunting I've ever done in October and in, in all my life, in fact. So I'm, I'm excited to, to go for it. So I, uh, again, I appreciate it. You bet. My pleasure. I'm glad I could do it. And, uh, and thank you for the well wishes. And, uh, I'm, I'm excited to do it cause I didn't get to guide hunters last year. I was, uh, I was still healing up. So, yeah. um, I'll you know, bet you're I, chomping I'm, at the bit. I'm, I'm apt. I'm ready. Yeah. Well, good for you, man. I'm glad you're all healed up. You know, um, thanks, buddy. I, I, sorry that happened, but uh, hey, you're all healed up and good to go. And and uh, you must be living right, brother, because that was a bad accident. And for you to be out the next year, guiding and hunting and doing everything you do, it's uh, you know somebody's looking out for you. So, and we're glad oh, they absolutely. are. Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Well, cool, man. You have a great rest of your hunting season. Keep me posted. Definitely keep me posted. Sure will. Uh, can't wait to see how it comes together for you and, and all your clients. And and uh, as always, let's just keep in touch, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Sounds good, Jim, and uh, best of luck to you for the rest of your season as well, man. Appreciate it. You made it. That's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please make sure you're following us on Instagram at The Western Huntsman and write us a good review at Apple Podcasts. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you 